Welcome to the Chain Effect Podcast, where a physical therapist and a dietitian married with two kids juggle the struggle of running a business, raising a family, and prioritizing our own health, all while trying to have as much fun as possible. We're your hosts, Taylor Pope, doctor of physical therapy, and Caroline Pope, registered dietitian. And together we own and operate a health facility bringing together physical therapists, dietitians, personal trainers, and active recovery services to create what we call the Chain, chain Effect. effect. We're lucky enough to have a special guest today, Russell Carter, friend, client, gym member, but he also (laughs) works for Scott Insurance as a benefits consultant and really has a pulse on the historical and evolving landscape of insurance and healthcare in America. And why even bother talking about insurance before everyone just goes to sleep? Well, first, thanks for having me. Exciting to be here and be part of the... uh, the struggle and juggle can relate to that uh, with my own family and kids and all good stuff. But I think that insurance is top of mind because one, we all deal with it. None of us really like it, but it's a necessary evil and it's ambiguous and it is complex and we deal with it uh, not in a, in a super frequent manner. um, Most of us. And and so it it can be very confusing and we need people to help make it simpler. Um, help bring you to life and help us take advantage of the opportunities that exist uh, that many don't know about. And where there is that fog of mystery is an opportunity to, you know, shed some light on things that are good, but also, or things that can be improved, but also shed some light on kind of where people are taking advantage of the situation, right? Yeah, no, no, no question. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult because, uh, people don't know where to go, how to access this care that they're provided for by their employer or by the government. Um, they're really walking in the dark and they don't have oftentimes a guide to get them to the right provider, to the right um, uh, um, surgery or procedure they need or the right PT uh, mm-hmm. that prevents down the line costs. So we really lack guidance and advocacy in the space. I know we've always just kind of looked at the plans. I mean, until recent years, last couple of years, I think we've looked a little bit more carefully, especially having young kids, but we've just kind of looked at the options within one company and been like, okay, I guess this is good. Right. right. And you're trying (laughs) to look at the benefit summary and decode what co-insurance means and when that kicks in and, and then trying to project out through the year, you know, what am I actually going to use? And then doing math on, you know, if I do this higher premium and, you know, how many visits is that going to account for before I'm making that money back? I mean, it just really is. There's a lot of ambiguity there, and I think we can do a better job. And this yeah. year, you'll understand with, with young kids, but this year we went for the lower, much lower deductible right. plan because Taylor said, you know, one of our kids could break their arm. They're crazy. And yeah. then that's it. And then we've used it. And then we can do all the other services. <laughs> that's right. It's, it's one fall off the couch. And you are so worried about the deductible. And, and oftentimes w- with a small business where you guys are situated, which is out in the open market, uh, you don't have plans that are designed to help you make good decisions. Right? They don't have the incentive piece um, that a really uh, well flushed out, well put together employer plan might have that reward people um, through financial incentives, often no cost or low cost to make good decisions, good preventive decisions for their health care. And, and the inverse is people often looked at what am I paying in my premium every month and what's the deductible? Right. And that is a very narrow way to make a decision that could impact your family. Mm-hmm. So how did we even get to the point where, you know, the employer is providing health care to the employee? When did that all start? Yeah, it's interesting, right? So we're one of, if not the only um, uh, modern country that uh, ties your health care to your employer. Uh, if you look at Europe, Canada, et cetera, it's provided by the government with some additional fringe opportunities for those who have means on top. And I'm not an advocate of that that system by any means, uh, despite our complex, ambiguity, ambiguous uh, uh, healthcare system, I do think the opportunity exists for us to have the best uh, of both worlds. But if you turn the clock back to the 40s in World War II, uh, there was a wage freeze. And so the only way, put, put in place by the federal government, the only way that employers could uh, enhance people to come work for them or entice them to come work for them was through fringe benefits. And so while health insurance existed before World War II, certainly, it became very important to the recruitment and retention of employees for 
uh, for employers to offer good benefits, uh, offer them at the time. They were probably free because it was very cheap. And that's how we've evolved from the 40s to today where uh, your employer is responsible for your health insurance. <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting. And, you know, I, I was actually talking to, you know, asking some questions about this to some other people that are in the know. And they said, yeah, actually the employers would also offer to like pay for your groceries. So they were just exploring like wow. all kinds of different fringe <laughs> benefits. It's like, yes, I drink the fine wine. You know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Only reds, please. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I mean, look at where it is today now too. Um, large employers, especially, it's not just healthcare, it's childcare, it's um, additional um, uh, maternity, paternity, prenatal, all kinds of other benefits that are tied to your family expenses. Mm -hmm. em some employers are uh, doing a good job of supporting through uh, the effort to recruit and retain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, bandwidth located just down the street from us, they have a Montessori school that right. just the employees can just drop their kids off. Wow. Right. Yeah. And, and that's tied to the, to the fact that bandwidth says your bottom must be in your seat on site five days a week. Right. Right. So um, in this world where most companies have gone hybrid and have a flexible work environment, the larger corporations that have said we've invested like bandwidth hundreds of millions of dollars in a beautiful facility and we're not going to let it sit empty. Well, what am I going to put there for my family or for my employees that's going to make sure they're there? And that's childcare. It's um, healthcare, on-site mm, nurses, even on-site pharmacy, um, all the things to take, take away the need to be flexible and work from home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have some, yeah, we know some other businesses who have the medical staff as well. Yeah. And, and as a business, I mean, we don't offer health insurance to our employees right now. And it's something that I've explored and I, I talked to another Russell Carter about it and, you know, he might have given me something different than Russell's going to say, but what he said was, you know, how are you doing it right now? And I said, we're providing a stipend for health insurance, but we're just, we're just telling them to go on the marketplace and, and find it yourself. And, and one of the things mm -hmm. that he told me was, you know, you're actually doing them a favor in a way because we're all paying for it through our taxes anyway. And yes, maybe the plans aren't as robust or convenient or tailored to their specific needs, but we're all paying for that through the, you know, Obamacare anyway. And so by giving them a stipend, you're able to pay them more. And so it can be sort of a win-win for the employer and uh, the employee in that case. But we're a small business you yeah, know, a you lot of the businesses, employees. yeah, and a lot of the ones that, you know, Russell deals with on a daily basis are, you know, 50 or more employees. So, um, I think, you know, that's how we're handling it, but there's, you know, we're always open to suggestions. Yeah, certainly not, not a wrong way to go about it by any means. A lot of small businesses either don't offer, uh, or they're generous and offer a stipend, but you're right. The, uh, I d am not an expert in the, uh, open market healthcare.gov, but it is designed to allow um, uh, uh, incentives for those based on their wage to be able to get coverage. Mm -hmm. So you, if you don't make a lot of money, you could probably get your health care for free in the open market. If you are making decent money, you're a PT, you get salary, maybe you don't get quite as, as much of a, a discount. So offering a little bit of a stipend is a, a good thing for your employees. Yeah, and then they can pick what fits their life, you know, if, they're, if they have kids, if they're thinking about having a family and you know, how old they are. So no question. Well, what is leading to higher premiums with my family's insurance every single year? Tell us that is uh, that's a million dollar question. Um, again, I want to speak from my lens, which is that uh, large or mid market employer group, and that's 50 employees and up offering uh, employer uh, sponsored health care. So not to speak to what's going on in the in the uh, open market, which you guys are in, but from an employer perspective, the Affordable Care Act did a lot of good things, right? It got coverage for lots of people. It required um, insurance companies to cover um, specific um, female needs that were not required before. So there were a lot of really good things that came out of the pre existing, ACA. you know, pre existing injuries, you know. That's right. Pre existing You get conditions. diagnosed with cancer right before you get insurance, you're going to be covered. Th right, exactly. And people should get coverage, right? They should be allowed to get coverage. The tough part is that it, it uh, also. Um, put a couple of laws in that on the surface seem like really good, but aren't, um, had unintended consequences. One of them is the 85, 15 medical loss ratio rule. What that means is that if you are an employer that offers healthcare to your 
uh, employees, you are fully insured, which means you pay a set premium every month to the insurance carrier, regardless of how your folks use the plan, right? They're paying your claims on your behalf. The carrier is required to spend 85 cents of every dollar that you pay them as the employer in premium on claims. So 85 cents of every dollar they take from the employer must be paid out in claims. And on the surface, you might go, man, yeah, that, that sounds, sounds right. Good. Yeah, that that's sounds great. Right. I, I mean, <laughs> hey, I'm paying you money. It should go to claims. It shouldn't line your pockets. Right. But I think you guys can, can um, relate to uh, being business owners. If I am told as a business that my margin is fixed, there's really only two ways that I can grow my business. And from an, an insurance carrier perspective, that's more people on the plan. Mm -hmm. So I have to advertise and, and market and bring in more lives or bodies or people. Or I have to have my pie get bigger. I have mm -hmm. to get more premium dollars because I'm, I'm set at 15 cents of every dollar. It doesn't allow for me to make the same amount of money and be more efficient with it, right? So what that's done is led to higher premiums because three of the four large insurance carriers are publicly traded. Mm -hmm. Now there's a lot of really good people that work there and they're doing a, trying to do a lot of really good things, but at the end of the day, they are publicly traded and have stock, mm -hmm. uh, have shareholders, and mm -hmm. they, their share price has to grow, like any business. Um, so that's one, one component of what's leading to higher healthcare premiums every year. The other one is uh, the annual and lifetime limits we're done away with. So uh, pre-ACA, if you were a member with insurance company A, um, during the plan year, your plan maybe started in January and ran for that year, starting in January, the law says the insurance company only had to reimburse up to a million dollars in claims on your behalf, right? And for the lifetime of your membership, they only had to reimburse $2 million in claims. Well, mm. those limits were taken away. And again, on the surface, you go, good, people should get the care they need. We, this is healthcare, right? This is not something that should be completely driven by dollars and cents. But if you fast forward 10 years later, uh, almost 12 years later, since the ACA went into effect, if the insurance companies know that they are going to get reimbursed from the hospitals for um, what, or excuse me, if the hospitals knows they're going to get reimbursed from the insurance company, regardless of how much the cost of the service is, well, the cost of the services are going to go up. Right. Yeah. So we have seen in the employer market the uh, explosion of million dollar claims. And that's simply because the hospitals through their charge masters have figured out that they are going to get reimbursed by the insurance company. So how does that affect an employer and their premiums? Well, year over year, as claims get more expensive and the costs go up, the insurance company is paying them out. Right? right? Because they're supposed to. That's their right. job. So eventually, mm. the, somebody has to pay that bill. And that trickles down to the employer who may um, have a fairly healthy population with a couple of people that get sick. And they're still getting a you know, double-digit increase year over year. Right. And they're getting less benefit too, right? Like the number, the premium goes up and what they get goes down every well, year, well, right? Well, the deductibles go up. The co-pays go up. You know, what they're covered for. The plan gets worse every year. Well, it certainly can. And I mean, that's a, that's a, uh, not a wrong, but it's certainly a very common strategy. If I'm an employee, mm -hmm. if I'm an employer with 75 employees and I get handed a 15% increase, uh, the only way for me to buy that down is to either make the plan worse, higher deductible, higher copay, or pass more of it on to my employees. Mm -hmm. It was a hundred bucks for the employee only tier and 500 for employee family. Well, a 15% increase. Sorry, guys. I just gave you a raise at the end of the year. That was great. Now I'm going to take it back <laughs> in your insurance premiums because I got because I'm a business and I've got to cover my All second comes biggest from one pot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and it reminds me too, you know, when I, my previous job before, you know, opening Chain Effect, I had insurance through my employer, but I also paid like $150 a month. So it's, it really wasn't that different than what I was making at the time if I had just gone on to the marketplace mm, at that yeah. point and my employer was spending who knows how much to keep that plan alive. Tell me a little bit about, you, you mentioned something to me that I, I thought was interesting, but maybe a little complex, but tell me about the vertical integration of these insurance companies and what that means and how it really impacts. Cause you know, my understanding is, you know, there's a middleman in this whole process and, you know, who is the middleman and who's paying them and am I paying myself? It's, it's, it's all really confusing to me. 
Yeah. Well, it's confusing to most people because they don't uh, nerd out on insurance every day like <laughs> I do, um, which maybe says something about me. But what you've seen over the years, the, the best way to describe vertical integration is the supply chain of healthcare is being consolidated, right? And, and the supply chain of health insurance is being consolidated. Case in point, right? Um, CVS, we all know CVS, now owns Aetna, one of hmm. the four largest insurance companies. <laughs> that seems right? like a hmm. some sort of conflict hmm. of interest. So, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and also, CVS has a very large, not only do they have pharmacies, CVS Caremark is one of the big three pharmacy benefit managers. So where it used to be that Aetna would handle your medical and then you'd uh, maybe put your pharmacy benefit management with a large PBM, right? Now those are integrated. And you mean, when you say pharmacy benefit manager, what what is that person doing exactly? Well, I mean, they're, they're, they're managing the prescription drug claims in a healthcare plan. Got it. So there's really two pieces in your healthcare plan, medical claims, doctors, providers, facilities, and then there's prescription drug management. So when you, when you have a script written for you, right, that ha- that whole supply chain of, of drugs has to be managed and what drugs are approved, what drugs are not approved, um, how they're paid for, where do you get them? So that's a whole, what, we PBMs just, are you know, a hot topic right now. They're I a huge topic. Yeah. yeah. So, so CVS owns Aetna, one. Cigna now owns Express Scripts. And mm. United Healthcare owns Optum. And Optum, Express Scripts, and CVS Caremark make up 80% of the pharmacy benefit market. So just we, because they're low, low, their physical locations or well, no, so these the PBMs don't think of them as like uh, your neighborhood pharmacy, CVS or Walgreens on the corner. Think of them as the one that controls the, the distribution of drugs from manufacturer mm. to the pharmacy, mm. to the patient. Mm. And they can have formulary control. Um, it's again, we could spend another episode. <laughs> talking CVS about seems PBM. so friendly. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, there's a lot of good people that work here, but I would, I would from a cynical perspective and maybe not even that cynical, uh, why do three of the four largest insurance carriers now own a PBM? Mm. Well, they're, right. not, they're not doing it because it helps because they lose money on it. Right. right. It becomes a gigantic profit center for them. And Blue Cross Blue Shield's no different. They own Prime Therapeutics, which is not as big as the other three, but a very large national PBM because they know if they can own not only the supply chain of medical claims, but also the pharmacy side, it just is a, a big profit center for them. And they have to compete, right? I mean, if one of them is doing it and getting ahead and getting more and more market share, it almost seems like the other ones have to follow suit because they have to stay relevant. They have to be able to compete on the national scale with the other insurance companies. So, so. yeah. And does this fall into like anti, is there some antitrust laws that are need to be talked about with this? Or is that like, <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think we've got that maybe later in the agenda, but yeah, the consolidated appropriations act was to drive transparency around uh, a significant amount of what is not transparent right now. Okay. But okay. yeah, you, we'll get to that part right. then. Um, they do have to, they do have to compete. And we saw this with blue cross just recently. Um, uh, because they are a nonprofit um, filed with some legislation to the state of North Carolina to create a for-profit arm separate from their insurance company because their claim was that they were not able to innovate because they were and they were falling behind the publicly traded for-profit carriers. Mm-hmm. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. I don't know what's behind their books. Mm-hmm. But uh, another example of them competing with each other all the time. Mm. So can you describe for us what the No Surprises Act is? Explain that a little bit. Yeah, this was a hot topic probably 12 months ago, 18 months ago or so. And, and we're seeing the result of it now. Um, don't, don't quote me on the date of when it was passed. Uh, but, but in the not too distant past, uh, the No Surprises Act came to be. And really, this eliminates what's known as balanced billing in, uh, in the insurance and provider world. So example, right? This is when a provider... A balanced bill is when a provider sends a bill to a patient for additional payment um, uh, for an out-of-network charge or just an additional charge when the patient had no idea, right? And this mm. came, the, the, the easy example here is anesthesiologists are often out of network, right? Mm-hmm. Well, um, somebody can do all their homework. Taylor could be having shoulder surgery, and you know what? He went through PT and did everything he could. And the last thing he could do was, okay, we've got to have surgery on this, right? Mm -hmm. And I went to a great orthopedist who's in network. And the orthopedist is in network and does surgery at Rex. And they're part of my network. And Taylor goes in for uh, his day of surgery. 
and he sees anesthesiologist maybe for 60 seconds, maybe he doesn't see him at all, and they come in and put him under. He wake, anesthesiologist wakes him up. They wheel him to another room. Taylor never met the person. Um, he thinks everything's done. 30 days later, gets a bill for, you know, $800, $2,500, $3,000 for the anesthesia because the anesthesiologist was out of network. Now, it sounds like I'm bagging on that, and I'm not. And I'm not. It's, this is just mm-hmm. the loading yeah. fruit example. Well, I've had that exact experience. I had a procedure done, and I was calling, making sure the facility was in network. They were, but they could not tell me what anesthesiologist was going to be on site the day of my procedure. So I couldn't even find out. They said, well, we have to have their number, the RD number and all this, but they couldn't tell me who was working that day. So I couldn't find out if they were in network or not. It's almost like you have to be like a logistics wizard to like make sure everything (laughs) is covered. Right. And you guys, and you and you guys are sort of in the world, right? Right. I mean, doctor PT, registered dietitian, like you sort of already have a little bit of a radar, what to ask. Think about Joe Q public. They don't have any idea what they should even be asking. They trust their yeah. they trust their doctor as they should. We've learned a lot. I mean, hard. for since we take insurance for nutrition counseling, just getting a network, being <laughs> you know having these contracts with insurance companies, and now seeing the other side of, we hate having to bill our patients out of pocket when they right. don't cover. But we're learning a lot about you know the verifications and what the rep is saying and how to get these claims covered when they said they were a network, but maybe now. They're not covering it, and well, it's made us... The codes aren't lining up. I yeah, mean, the codes a, aren't lining up. So we've learned a lot, but it, yeah. we definitely, because of this, we ask a lot more questions for our own personal health stuff. Right. So right. so the No Surprises Act, that's a that's a Congress move, right? Right, that's a federal law. Okay, that's federal law. So all of a sudden now you have to be transparent with the costs up front. And so, yeah, I mean, I feel like this this makes total sense. If, if I want to, I should be able to shop around for where I can get, you know, an ACL repair done the cheapest, right? That's right. But are they making that easy? Is is that, is that easy now or? I think it's easier than it was. I think it's, I, hopefully it's going to be a lot easier in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, Because they're not publishing these rates. Yeah. I don't think it's it's easy yet. (laughs) (laughs) Cause then you, didn't you have a, you had that radiological thing. Yeah. I was going to get a a scan and, you know, they just booked me. I think my, my doctor was like, yeah, just go here, wake radiology or something affiliated with a local big hospital. And then I called around to different places and ended up finding a place to ask prices, um, found a place in Durham that because it was not connected to a big hospital, it was half the price. Yep. And they told me that and I said, okay, well, I'll go there. Uh, you know, it's fine. Done. Minutes, right? <laughs> That's right. M- MRI is like the lowest hanging fruit example, right? You get an MRI done in the hospital, 2,500 bucks. You go to independent freestanding to get an MRI done, 750, 800 ballpark, mm-hmm. right? And so from our perspective, when we work with employer groups, the idea is to set up these sort of decision trees or these forks in the road for members that are almost seamless, right? Hey, Taylor or Carolyn, you have to go get this done. And if you want to go do it in hospital, it's going to cost you 2,500, your deductible, mm. up to your deductible. But if you make the right decision and we have someone or a third party that's engaging with these employees, say, go down the street and get it, and it'll be free for you. Mm. Because the employer plan knows they're going to pay seven fifty dollars versus a whole lot more. Wow. So the, it's just these little decisions for trees that, that we need to make seamless. Now, in terms of being transparent for a member, I know Blue Cross has a product called Smart Shopper that they've been pushing for a while that mm. allows Blue Cross members to get online and compare the prices of, of, of procedures. And I'm sure all the other big insurance carriers have a similar product. Um, so that's helpful. Um, but we'll talk about when we get to this Consolidated Appropriations Act, there's one other piece in there that hopefully will allow things to be even more transparent for folks Great. moving forward. All right, well, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll really dive into that. And we're back. And there's another uh, congressional act or federal law that just came into effect in 2002 called the Consolidated Appropriations Act, another CAA, ABA, C, ACA <laughs> type, <laughs> type of thing. But ACC. Yeah, I've never heard of this one. So tell us a little bit about what's going on with that and you know why it's important to me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so broad strokes, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, which couldn't sound more Congress, right? It's called the CAA, <laughs> uh, was passed in 2022 with the intent to drive transparency in 
what um, we pay for for services and how providers are reimbursed, right? So that that um, those items of data have never been forefront to the member or to the health plan provider. Uh, and so there's a couple of things. One, um, the CAA states that all vendors in an insurance program, that's medical carriers, pharmacy benefit manager, et cetera. So m- all the arms of the actual plan, right? Everything from like, you know, the administrator. Right. Administration, yeah. what the provider gets, how much the PBM pays for the drug, how much they're charging you for the drug, what do they make off of the drug, how much, what rebates do they drive off of a specialty medication, which is one you rebates. see a commercial for. Tell me about the rebates. Well, so when you, anytime you have a specialty medication, and when I say specialty, think of something you see a commercial for on the Super Bowl, right? These are the <laughs> big name brand drugs that, um, that are very, very expensive. Well, in, in, in a very simple way, right, the pharmacy benefit manager has a formulary of drugs, and the manufacturer of these drugs um, wants to be on that formulary so that the members will take it. If it's on the formulary, the doctor prescribes uh, a certain drug for a certain condition, and the only way the manufacturer gets those drugs in the member's hands is to be on that formulary. So basically, like, this drug is in network with your insurance or? Yeah, in, in, a, in, a, in a very simplified way, absolutely, okay. right? This is an approved drug for said condition, mm, right? Mm-hmm. So these really expensive specialty drugs that oftentimes cost a member, they're what we call a specialty copay, their highest tier of copay. Sometimes it's $250 a month or a script. Sometimes it's $500 a month or a script. Um, in actuality, cost about $100,000 or more for the health plan. So wow. what happens is, these large expensive drugs have rebates tied to them. And the drug manufacturer will guarantee a certain level of rebate, sometimes 25, 30, 35% of the total cost of the drug in order to gain formulary placement or access. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of like a car rebate, although those don't really exist anymore. Uh, Manufacturer says, I want my drug to be on the formulary. I'll give you a 35% rebate on that drug to be placed on the formulary. And so... um, the tough part is that in the past, we have never really been given full access to what those rebate dollars are. And when we talk about the vertical integration in the last segment, when the health insurance carrier owns the PBM, they keep those rebate dollars. Oh. So real life example, you get diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, you have to take a really expensive drug. Your provider gives you the drug and maybe it's the right drug, right? Maybe it's the drug you really need and mm-hmm. that's fine. Um, you're paying your copay for it, but your health plan, your employer, or the insurance company is paying for the rest of that drug on your behalf. And the insurance company owns the PBM. So they're keeping those rebate dollars to themselves and it becomes a profit center. So that's another kind of piece mm. of the vertical integration. The CAA um, uh, states that all of those hidden costs, hidden payments, um, are to go away. We're allowed to see the data. It's called a gag clause. And a gag clause is essentially just a, um, a clause in a contract that hides pricing. Right. <laughs> so we are at the very beginning of this. 2022, we think, oh, it should be here by now. It's 2024. But we know how long it takes to implement legislation and regulation. Mm. So it's still trickling down. But the world should be opening um, in terms of tra- price transparency even more through the CAA. There's also a piece of that called gets really nerded out guys, but it's called machine readable files. And so the providers in the hospitals were required to um, divulge and put out what they pay and what their charge master is and what they pay providers and what they charge for services all through. It's called a machine readable file, which means Taylor and Russell and Caroline can't read this. It takes a machine to read it (laughs) literally. And so the exciting thing though, is that there are companies that have created algorithms that can actually read these files, which is bringing to light um, the difference in cost in that MRI Mm -hmm. that you experienced just how many ever months ago? $2,000 one place, $750 another, right? You don't know you did the research, right? But how do we make that front and center for for the member? Yeah. How much are we paying the person who walks us from one room to the other? (laughs) No, I take the the TPS reports <laughs> to, you know, the That's engineers. Right. That's you right. You physically take them? Mm-hmm. Well, no, no. Uh, well, and you know, I, it, it, I, I ingest, right? But that's not the person. That's not where the waste is. The waste is at the top. Uh. Um, 
do we need marble floors and um, gigantic f- fountains in our hospitals? <laughs> they, we want them to be nice, but they should be yeah. utilitarian. The Rex Heart, Heart Center is like a museum. Yeah. I mean, it's nicer UNC than... UNC Rex. Well, UNC no. Rex. Yeah, UNC <laughs> Rex, hell, the, the Heart Center. Yeah, it's is beautiful. Like, oh, my yeah. gosh. Right, right. And yeah, anyway, that's a whole other can of worms. So, okay. So what are some alternatives then for employers and, you know, what are best practices for employers when managing their health plan? Yeah, yeah. So a couple of best practices. Um, well, the first one ties also to the CAA. Um, it not only requires uh, insurers, medical providers, hospitals, PBMs, et cetera, to be transparent into what they charge. It also in- requires people like me, the insurance broker, consultant, advisor, to be transparent in my fee. Mm. I have to be able... To- I should tell my my client what they're paying me. And I know that that seems like second nature. How do you make money, Russell? <laughs> How would you say you make money? So that's a great question. They um, For a long, long time, and the way that it's still done is it's baked into a premium. So the carrier is paying us. The, the employer pays the carrier, and the carrier then pays the, ins- the insurance broker, uh. right? It's sort of built into their cost. And so um, this was less of a big deal when premiums were a couple hundred bucks a month. Um all in now when it's much more expensive, uh, it, 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 it needs to be divulged yeah. because often it was a percentage of the premium went to the broker. 5% mm-hmm. was sort of standard back in the day. Well, when it's gets to be a very expensive line item, the broker is getting a raise without really doing anything. Right. So we stay away from commission based payment. And if I'm an employer, the first thing I'm going to ask my, my, uh, my broker is one, how do you get paid? Right. If they're mm-hmm. not already providing an annual statement that shows their compensation, which they're required to by the CAA, I'm going to say, how are you getting paid? And if it's on a commission basis, maybe that's okay, but they need to spell it out and I need to know. Mm-hmm. Preferably, we work on either a straight fee, right, an annual fee that's paid monthly, mm-hmm. or oftentimes it's a per employee per month fee. And we sort of like that, and I think a lot of our, our employer groups like that, because if you have 100 employees, you're paying me a per employee per month fee to manage your plan. If you have an acquisition or you grow a bunch, there's inevitably going to be more work for me and my team and we're compensated fairly or God forbid you have a layoff Mm -hmm. and you reduce staff, then you're paying me a little less because we're probably doing a little less work. Mm -hmm. And that, and and folks seem to like that kind of get what you pay for piece. So, uh, compensation, clarity, disclosure from your brokers, a great first best practice. Um, what are you paying them? And then they should be disclosing if they're, uh, getting compensation from other sources, mm. right? Mm. Are they being paid by a PBM or paid wait, by Wait, wait, wait. The PBMs can pay sure. the broker too? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, wait. This is these Anything PBMs. Anything can happen. <laughs> <These PBMs. laughs> well, I, I don't want I don't completely pick on the PBMs, but any, any vendor in a healthcare plan, right? If you think about my seat and the people that do what I do, we sort of have the access to all of these employers, all of our clients. Well, the vendors in a healthcare plan, they want to get with the employers, right? And so we sort they kind of view us as maybe a gatekeeper to their business. And so they want to not only show me and my team the best products and services that are out there so that we'll recommend them, but there are places that, um, you know, have incentives to the broker to place a certain amount of business with said vendor. And it's not just PBM, it's everybody. So, and th- I mean, this isn't... Is that top down? Is that is that in each, like, let's say... Well, for instance, Scott Insurance. Now, I know Scott Insurance gets paid by just the employer, but said, you know, broker company A, is there that downward pressure for them to get such and such amount to go with insurance company A versus insurance company B? I mean, there could be, right? We don't work that way, so I can't really speak to exactly, and I don't want to speak ill of the competition, so I don't know exactly how their model works, but I do know that in our world, um, and this is something we talk about with prospective clients all the time. It is not an off, off the box product or offering, right? It's mm-hmm. not this, here's box one. You can either buy that through me or here's box two. It's let's sit down and talk about what's going on with your population, with your employees, what's your culture like, uh, how engaged is your leadership, what's important. And let's put a customized program together because I'm not beholden by any outside partner to be part of the program or to sell that specific thing. Right. And you were kind of blowing my mind when I was talking to you. This was, uh, I, I think this must have been just in the locker room. You, you were talking to me about employer 
employer driven, I forget what you said, it was employer sponsored or employer driven health plans where you're basically taking out the big insurance company. Maybe you're putting their name on it, but you're basically taking them completely out of the Mm -hmm. equation and the employers themselves are taking all the money for the insurance premium and managing managing the money and paying out yeah paying the claims paying the claims themselves yeah so that's a that, that, that's sort of best practice number two one transparent advisor mm-hmm. or broker right and how they're getting paid two if you're over 50 employees and especially if you're over 75 employees you also need to be engaging with your consultant to ensure that they are the type of broker that can help you decouple from the insurance carrier mm. right so um, I want to set up a plan um, and I don't say not not divorce yourself from, but decouple yourself from this program or this system where one entity owns the whole thing, right? Inevitably, when someone owns a supply chain in any business, they end up getting margin from each piece of the supply chain, right? It, it, it happens in shipping all the time. I want to own the manufacturer. I want to own the person that's making the widget. I want to own how we ship it. And I want to own the delivery and the sale. Right, that's true in any business. It's the same thing in healthcare. So I want to decouple myself from that. Mm-hmm. Um, I still want to, oftentimes, um, have one of those logos: insurance company A, B, C, D. Right, Sigma United, Blue or, Cross. Yeah. Right, and and they they do they provide a good service. They provide access to doctors and hospitals, and that makes people feel good. And they need to have access. So, oftentimes, um, from a recruiting and retention perspective, I need to be able to show that new hires or my existing employees, look, we've got a national logo on our card. You can feel good about it. You're going to be able to see your PCP. Mm-hmm. You're going to be able to see your dietitian. Interesting. Right? Yeah. So we want to pay for that access, but then we want to pull the actual claims payment and we want to pull the pharmacy benefit management and we want to pull a little bit of insurance we need to buy to cap our worst case scenario away from the insurance carrier and manage it ourselves. This is an insurance line, but we say it all the time, Right. Insurance is a poor way to finance your risk. Hmm. So think about that for a second, right? I have a risk, whether it's on the business insurance side, workers' comp, et cetera, or in healthcare. There's a risk there in that population. And buying more insurance is a bad way to finance that risk because if I'm buying more and more and more and more insurance, there's a margin attached to that. Think back to the 8515 rule. Mm-hmm. There's yeah. profit, there's overhead, there's taxes, there's the insurance company's profit. We want to break away from that. Right. We want to pay them for what they're good at and what they need to do. And then we want to manage it ourselves by catastrophic insurance for a layman's terms to make sure that my employer or my organization knows what the worst case scenario is and I'm not going to blow my budget up. But we want to manage it ourselves. And so that's why you hire an advisor who's transparent, clear, and has experience walking you down that path because it's not a oftentimes overnight process. It's a step-by-step multi-year plan right mm-hmm. what i hear you saying it's kind of like aligning the incentives right so if the in, if the insurance companies are incentivized to charge more premiums because they can make more profit but what, what i hear you saying is when we decouple that that money is going back toward the employers to which they can pay higher salaries have other benefits coming in mm-hmm. and so really having someone who I mean, this is a complex world. Obviously, we've been talking about it for 40 minutes, but having someone who really understands the ins and outs is a game changer. And, you know, one of the things that's so interesting to me is we have some we have some patients, obviously, who found us via different realms. This particularly happens in our nutrition wing, but we've um, gone to them and said, hey, you know, do any of your coworkers... Also, do you think any of your coworkers might have a need for nutrition? And could we just, you know, create a flyer for you that just outlines how great your company's benefit is for nutrition? Mm -hmm. And one email, they sent it out, and all of a sudden we had 15 patients from this from this company calling wanting to sign up. Calling wanting to sign up. And it's just because no one knew. No one knew that they had that benefit. So, you know, is is and another best practice for the employer to just kind of outline the awesome things that the insurance does provide. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you mentioned it in the first couple of minutes when you were choosing your insurance last time. And you you were you actually said you were reading through the benefit summaries 
There's also a thing called the summary plan description, the SPD, that no, well, 99,000 out of 100,000 people are never going to read because it's very detailed. But you're right. People don't know. And even baked into these, what I call, what I was saying, fully insured or, um, you know, models that are controlled by the carrier, the carrier has a lot of stuff in there. But mm-hmm. it's almost um, so much that it's hard to communicate that to employees. So absolutely a best practice is to communicate what you have. We have it. Um, mental health, um, just health and wellness benefits are top of mind for our clients all the time, especially those that are a little bit smaller and maybe aren't self-funding their plan. And they mm-hmm. go, we really need to add in blah, 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 blah. Well, the first step is, hey, let's stop. Let's see what Cigna, Blue Cross, Aetna, whomever already has baked in. And let's utilize those services you're already paying for first. Right. Right. And then if that's not enough, then maybe we could add in something you're going to pay an extra fee for. Yeah. Right? Um, but then even more so when you think about being 75 employees or larger and you go into what this, this self-funded health plan, right? You're decoupling yourself from the carrier. So you're using their network for access, but their services and all the things they add in over here go away because you're simply just paying them a rental fee to access the providers. So at that point, then you really have to do a great job of advertising to your employees around, look, we specifically vetted vendor X, and this is who we've chosen because we think it's in your best interest. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and all the way down the line for the myriad of different things you've put into your health plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. communication is so difficult for employees. It's like we've, done, so the, important. we've yeah. done the research. Here's who you should go see. And if you do, it's going to be covered. Right. If you want to just do your own research and go yeah. wherever, you're going to end up paying a well, little bit more. Well, this reminds mm-hmm. me of a, a patient I had a while back who had a specific plan. I think I think by their employer, it was like this. And I wasn't a network or, you know, but he was going to ask to see if I could be added. So if they have a practitioner they've been working with who is not in, can you develop a relationship with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, provider and get them in, in that specific network. Um, yeah, that's not something that we do, but the insurance carriers have an army of folks that are always working on their network. And look, their val- one of their big values is access. Mm-hmm. So they wa- I'm sure that they want Taylor Pope to be in network on the PT side. I'm sure they would love to not bring gonna you happen. in. Not going to happen. I know, I know. Not, hey. not going to happen for all the reasons we're discussing right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hey, not your model. And I love you as a patient. I love your model. I get yeah. it. Um, there's a pace, I guess there is a place for the insurance driven PT, but they would love to have access. So yes, absolutely. And this is true in dental or vision or whomever, Mm -hmm. right? They Mm -hmm. always want to get those guys in network and they have advocates in the market that are constantly working on putting contracts in place. Very cool. Very cool. Well, in closing, Russell, this has all been super enlightening, but is there anything that is on the horizon that you are most excited about changing or you think is going to make a huge impact in the next year or two years that, you know, employees or employers should really be on the lookout for? Well, one one thing specific to the state of North Carolina, and this is not new news, but the fact that the state health plan has chosen Aetna to mm. be their insurer. Oh, yeah, we know about um, that. So you guys are aware of that. I think that has a chance to be um, just make changes. I'm not saying it was good or bad. Um, Blue Cross was a longstanding partner and a good partner for the state for a long, a long time. Um, but just the fact that they're changing what the insurance folks would be called the payer mix. It's a very insurance term, but changing (laughs) that up will um, be interesting. Aetna's network by default will get better. So it'll create competition, Uh, which is good. Yeah. That's good for everybody. Um, We didn't even, I cannot believe we spent 45 minutes talking about healthcare and weight loss drugs did not come up. Oh Um, yeah. Hot topic. Yeah. So Ozempic, Wagovi, all the GLP ones um, that are semi-glutide drugs are the hottest topic, uh, uh, in the market, state health plan again decided not to cover them. They're dropping them, um, which oh. uh, is a uh, is interesting. And um, as a dietitian, I'm sure you have very keen thoughts on that. Um, <laughs> but that's that's something we could spend more time on. I think that's something to watch. These drugs yeah. are incredibly effective, and they're they are good drugs for the right people. Right. And there's mm-hmm. a lot of strategy on how mm-hmm. you cover them or don't cover them or utilize them. Um, they're not for me or you that's trying to lose 20 pounds. Because right. we look better in the summertime, right? But they are really <laughs> yeah. effective for those who need them. So that'll be interesting yeah. to see where they land. They're also working to get more indications, right? right? Like yeah. any any. I mean, I think drug. for us yeah. with those, you know, Zempic, we would be more than happy to sort of consult and walk along alongside the patient who is sure. who is taking it. But there's because, a lot of yeah. overuse and yeah. and you know easy doctors prescribing them a little too easily for patients, in my opinion, right. but. 
Um, yeah, very interesting topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're massive side effects. But uh, in closing, yeah, I know we're, we're wrapping up on our time. But I would tell anybody that is in an, an HR, a finance, an operations, a, a, a benefit seat, that they need to treat their health plan like a budget, right? Mm. It is either every company's second or third biggest line item. And yet oftentimes, and I'm not pointing the finger at employers or blaming them, but historically we have um, gone through renewal, created our cost, and set it on the shelf right. for nine months. And if you did that with anything else you bought in your in your business, right, you'd be pretty inefficient. The cost of your inputs goes up, you try to find a new supplier. So treat it like a budget, right? Work with somebody who can provide a multi-year vision of what better could be, and then iterate and iterate and iterate. Your health plan's complex, mm. and employers should be willing to evolve so they can maintain a cost-efficient program with a really high-functioning benefit for their employees. Yeah, your needs yeah. change, so why wouldn't you, you know, you got to change things up. You got to shop around. Yeah, that's so, great advice. Yeah. Personalize, personalize, individualize. That's what we're all about. That's what own. we need. That's right. Well, thank you, Russell. This has been awesome, and uh, we know where to go if we have more questions. <laughs> where can people find you if they have any questions? Well, they can find me on LinkedIn, certainly. I'm pretty pretty good presence there. Again, it's Russell Carter. I work with Scott Insurance here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, my, e- my email address is easily accessed, but find me on LinkedIn. Look me up there. Google Scott Insurance Raleigh. Throw my name in. It'll pop right, right up. Uh, not a huge social media user. Maybe I should be to push some of this content out there, but I don't have an Instagram or uh, handle or anything like that. Taylor's Instagram list out. either. Yeah. Or, but, uh, <laughs> as well. We, so. that, that could speak. I'm on the Facebook. <laughs> He's old school on the Facebook, but not on the gram. Taylor, yeah. Taylor and I are the same generation here. Yeah. Of like, you know, we're, we're going to be a little bit old in our, in our age, but that's all right. That's okay. Thanks so much for coming on. We enjoyed speaking with you. And we will see you on the flip side. Catch you later. It was a real pleasure, guys. Thank you.